Let's talk about generic constraints. I believe my personal and personal opinion is that Microsoft added this feature that is less used but also has its place. But they added this feature, I think, to make up for some shortcomings with generics compared to the C++ language. Uh, C++ has templates. If you don't know about templates, no worries. Let's learn about constraints. I have a method here called produce a, and it has to produce a T. Okay, and notice the return type is T. I'm not taking any arguments here. I just want this method to return an instance of type T. So let's uh, let's make our first attempt at doing so. I'm going to say T return val gets new T return return val. Hopefully straightforward. But notice we get the red squigglies. I'm going to hover over the red squiggly. Cannot create an instance of the variable type t because it does not have a new constraint. Well, what is a new constraint? Well, let's first of all talk about why we even need the constraint in the first place. T here can be any type. Okay, so let's let's make some types here. Class, um, class one. Okay, we'll make a constructor. Let's bring the constructor up here. Just keep everything on one line. I'm going to make a class two. Two and here's two. Uh, with two's constructor though, let's take an int i and a char c. So two's constructor requires a little bit more than the class one because class one has a parameterless constructor that supposedly knows how to set up some state of class one. Okay, now I could call produce a t with both of these types: class one, oopsie, and cl class two like so forth and scrolling up here let's get the classes back in view well notice that class one when i call produce a with class one t becomes class one so essentially i'm really saying class one here new class one well look at class one it has a parameterless constructor Okay, but now we have a problem here. Produce A with class 2. Well, when T becomes class 2, class 2 does not have a parameterless constructor. It requires two arguments. Alright, so the compiler, even though it could look at my call site here and, and probably decide, oh, you know, you're, you're uh, calling it with class 1, so we'll allow this to work, but we won't allow this to work. Look, you know, in theory, I guess the compiler could do that, but it won't. It's only obligated to look uh, go off of the information it has in the scope of the generic argument. So that would be all this, right? The compiler only looks at this scope at once and nothing else. And one reason it does that is this little side tangent, but we'll see this a little later. These generics compile down to the missile and can be consumed by other code from and DLLs, and so it, it can't make any assumptions about who's calling it from where. It could be called 10 years from now if somebody adds a reference to my DLL uh, and calls this code. So the compiler won't make any assumptions there. It just says, hey, here's produce A, I see T, T's a generic, you're trying a new T, and I don't know, we're not always guaranteed that T will have a parameterless constructor. Okay? So there's a few ways as us as the programmers can add some information into the scope to say, compiler, you know what, this is actually legal, and let me show you how to do that. I'm going to say where T uh, new. All right, now, I'm not calling the new operator. I'm simply adding some information here about what T can do. And I'm saying T uh, has a parameterless constructor. If somebody calls this method with a T, I require that that T has a parameterless constructor. So notice the red squiggly went away here. The compiler is satisfied in the scope, saying, hey, yeah, okay, I can call new T with a parameterless constructor. Totally fine. But the call site, ooh, look at this. All right, produce A with class 2, the compiler's flagging, saying, hey, um, class 2 must be a non-abstract type with a public parameterless constructor in order to use it as a parameter for T and the generic type or blah, blah, blah. It's a long way of saying, hey, buddy, your uh, class 2 doesn't have a parameterless constructor, and, uh, and produce A requires a parameterless constructor. Now, just because I require that doesn't necessarily mean I have to use it. I could comment this out here. And, and uh, we, get the, we get this right squiggly because I'm not returning anything. But still, the restriction remains that T must have a parameterless constructor. And we're not calling uh, produce A with a parameterless, parameterless constructor. Say that 50 times fat. Now, I suppose this is by wise decision, but sometimes I wonder why uh, the C-sharp designers didn't flex this. Uh, the only restriction I can put on the uh, constructor for a type 
is the parameter list constructor. I can't come up here and say int u char c uh, to, to match this constructor up here. I can only have a parameter list one. So, oh well. Now, I'm going to take you down into what I think is a little bit of a shady, almost dark corner of the language, but there's more restrictions we can do with these uh, constraints. We could uh, we could say t, t, uh, oh, t is a class 1, okay? Or it inherits class 1. That's what I'm saying here when I write this is t inherits class 1 or it is a class 1. It's something of class 1. So produce a class 1 satisfies both conditions, obviously, because t is a class 1, and it has a parameterless constructor. But class 2 neither inherits nor is a class 1, nor does it have a parameterless constructor. Well, we can satisfy one of those constraints by inheriting class 2 from class, or inheriting from class 1 in class 2. Okay, but then we still have this parameterless constructor constraint. Now, if I t go here and I take the arguments away, now class 2 satisfies both conditions. But let's make a, a class, let's make a class 3. Okay, class 3 will be the same as class 1 and 2, except it won't inherit anything. I guess by default it inherits object, but everything inherits object. So if I say uh, produce a, produce a class 3, print, print, well, class 3 has a parameterless constructor, but class 3, oh, sorry, I still have the inheritance there. Class 3 does not inherit class one so so then we get the squigglies here okay so anyway that's, that's kind of some of the basics of uh of constraints in the next video i'm going to show a few more constraints and elaborate a little further on what these uh, generic constraints are and and other types of constraints